I'm Lee Teschler, Executive Editor of Design World and EE World. And I'm Kelsey Ferrante, Associate Editor. Today we are going through a super inexpensive smartphone from Blue Products called the R1 HD. The phone made a media splash last summer when it debuted because you could get it for as little as $50 from Amazon if you were an Amazon Prime member and were willing to put up with seeing ads on the phone's lock screen. With high-end phones like the iPhone going for somewhere north of $600, you might wonder what you get in a phone selling for less than one-sixth that amount. So to start off, we'll make some basic comparisons with the iPhone 6S. Some of the more notable differences are the processors, memory, and cameras. The Blue Phone uses a 1.3 gigahertz quad-core processor from MediaTek. Meanwhile, the iPhone uses a 1.85 gigahertz dual-core processor of Apple's design. The iPhone has twice as much RAM, two gigabytes compared to one in the blue, and 16 gigabytes of storage compared to eight in the blue. But you can upgrade the blue to the same amount of memory and storage as the iPhone for only about $10 or so. Both phones have a five megapixel camera for selfies, but the iPhone has a 12 megapixel camera in front compared to an eight megapixel front camera for the blue. So the quality of the images isn't as good on the blue. We didn't try using the phone because we would have had to add a SIM card and sign up with a wireless carrier to make use of its features. But reports in the press we've seen say the front camera isn't as good as that on higher end phones. Right. A rule of thumb about cameras is that the deeper the camera body, the better the picture it takes, simply because cameras with more depth to them have more room for optical components. We've detached the blue's front and back camera, and it's easy to see that the selfie camera is shallower than the main camera, meaning it just doesn't have the same quality of internals. The exterior back of the phone comes off readily, which is a plus if you need to replace its lithium battery. And the battery has only one connection, so it detaches easily. The back of the phone case comes off when you unscrew a few super tiny Torx screws. But what you notice about the back cover is that there are no facilities for wireless charging in the blue phone. That's kind of a bummer. A lack of wireless charging seems to be part of the price you pay for a cheap smartphone. But once you're in the phone, you can begin to see why the cost of smartphones has come down. It used to be that smartphones contained two separate CPUs. One would handle a network protocol and the basic functions of a phone. The other would run the user interface and applications. The architecture was as though a PDA, or a personal digital assistant, had been combined with an old-fashioned feature phone. The two processors had a thin communication interface and inter operated independently of each other. Isn't that a little weird? Can't you just use one processor to handle both functions? With the graphics and video that modern smartphones provide, that approach probably makes sense. The R1 HD we examine has only one processor chip, which obviously handles both PDA and phone functions. But that chip is what's called a system-on chip, and it does contain two processors, a quad-core ARM device for phone functions and a graphics processing unit for the rest of it. And being able to put the two processors in one package is probably part of the reason blue products could get the cost of the phone down. So how does the electronics on this phone lay out? pretty much the way you find it laid out on all smartphones these days. There are two circuit boards in the phone, one on the top of the phone, the other on the bottom. They connect to each other through a flex circuit. The board in the top of the phone contains most of the electronics. The small board at the bottom contains a vibration motor, the microphone, connections for the speakerphone, a USB interface, and part of the antenna. Now, some smartphones won't use a flex circuit like this one. Instead, they'll use one circuit board with a section that runs the length of the phone on one side and connects the upper and lower parts. Finally, there is a wire that connects between the two boards. That's, that wire is just simply part of the antenna. I see a lot of metal pieces laying around. What's that about? Well, that's all metal shielding that we removed from both sides of the upper board. What's sort of interesting is that some of the metal shielding pops off. It takes the form of a lid that uh, comes off a metal framework surrounding some of the chips. But there are other chips covered by a shield that can only be pried off. And there doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason as to why some chips are covered by a removable shield when others aren't. Why don't we go through what we see here? Right. 
When you open the phone case, you see the side of the top board that contains the SIMs, or subscriber identity modules, used to identify and authenticate subscribers to a phone network. Also on this side is the LED used for flash photography and as a flashlight. There's a small metal shield covering some of the circuitry around the LED, including a small 24-pin chip that we can't identify, but which may be some kind of LED driver. The other side of the board is more interesting. The heart of the design consists of four chips from MediaTek, a chip maker in Taiwan. The main chip is a system on a chip device called the MT6735 that I mentioned earlier. It's a 64-bit quad-core ARM Cortex-A53 processor combined with an ARM Mali T720 graphics processor, along with several other functions. There are sections of the chip that handle multimedia, the cameras, the display, provide modem functions, and wireless functions. Most of that stuff makes sense, but what does the modem do? Well, the modem is how you send digital data back and forth from the phone when you're doing things like internet browsing or email. It's analogous to the cable modem you have if you get internet access from your cable TV provider. The cable modem is basically a transceiver that decodes internet data off the cable signal and vice versa. The modem in this phone does something similar using either Wi-Fi signals, Bluetooth signals, or phone signals. But there's one part of the chip that's a bit mysterious, at least to me. MediaTek says the chip handles connectivity, and specifically connectivity over Wi-Fi, FM radio, GPS, a Russian version of GPS called GLONASS, a Chinese version called BDS, and Bluetooth. But the phone also contains a separate Bluetooth chip, the MT6626. So I'm not quite sure what the MT6626 does for a Bluetooth connection if the processor chip is supposed to be handling it. Well, if somebody watching this video knows that secret, maybe that's something they can explain in the comment section of this video. But there are five other big chips on the side of the board. Right. One of them is a power management chip, which generally has a lot of features and is sometimes called the PMIC. This one contains five buck converters, 28 LDOs, drivers for two LED channels, as well as controls for battery charging, the power-up sequence, and a real-time clock alarm. Next to the PMIC and the processor chips is a 16 gigabit flash memory chip from SK Hynix in Korea. The processor chip, the PMIC, and the flash memory all sit inside one of the metal shield structures. On the other side of this shielded area is a separate shielded area containing three other big chips and about a dozen tiny ones. The tiny chips don't contain any definitive markings, so we couldn't identify them. But the three big ones were easy to figure out. One is a MediaTek MT6169 RF transceiver. This is the RF chip that works with the data coming in and out of the modem. It supports up to eight primary RF inputs and another eight RF inputs for diversity gains. It works with more than 30 mobile frequency bands that is configurable to handle the standard you find in different parts of the world. There are two other RF chips inside this particular metal shield. They're both from Skyworks, a chip maker in Massachusetts. One is a surface acoustic wave filter slash directional coupler RF front end that basically keeps the RF transmissions from the phone from interfering with the reception of the much weaker RF signals coming in from a cell tower or whatever. The second Skyworks chip is a multi-band RF power amplifier, and it basically is what puts out the RF power signal that goes to the phone antenna when the phone transmits a phone call. And that's basically all there is to the phone. So did you find any surprises on the blue phone? Well, one thing we were looking for was an audio codec for playback and recording of digital audio, but we didn't find one. It's probably integrated into the processor system chip. Another interesting point is that there doesn't seem to be an antenna switch. This is typically a MEMS SPST switch that lets the antenna handle incoming weak RF as well as the much stronger outgoing transmitter RF by switching back and forth. The fact that the Skyworks SAW filter chip sits right next to the connection for the antenna makes us think it is taking the place of the MEMS switch, which is kind of interesting. After all this, what's the difference between a smartphone that costs $50 and one that goes for about five times that much? Well, increasingly not that much. In their structure and hardware architecture, they are much the same. You sacrifice a little resolution in the camera. There may be slightly less memory, but that's upgradable for a few extra dollars. 
There doesn't seem to be much difference in performance for factors like download and connection speed because the phone network you're on mainly determines that stuff. We couldn't really evaluate the phone's user interface software, so there may be some differences there. You don't get wireless charging, at least not yet. If you can live with these limitations, a $50 phone might be okay for you. Sounds like a $50 smartphone might be a good way to go easy on your pocketbook. And with that, our time is up. You can see more teardown videos at eeworldonline.com.